what I think we need to work on practicing again and just doing a review of is the different levels of how our brain thinks and the different levels for the way our brains focus on what we're trying to analyze. So the big thing to keep in mind is that there is this difference between what the author is actually saying, the words they're using, and then the bigger argument and the bigger purpose that they have. And so your brain needs to be able to separate those two things out. That you're looking at what is literally in the text, I'm using that appropriately, what is actually in the text, what words do they use, what do they focus on, <clears throat> and then how does that connect to this bigger, broader idea concept, okay? So it's, again, my little uh, circles that show the different levels of how your brain works. There's what's in the text itself, there's what connects to the author's purpose, and then how that relates to the entire rest of the world, okay? This, the, the more universal ideas uh, connecting throughout the entire world, connecting throughout time, through uh, human history, and in this like the sequence of growth we have as a society, right? So again, how does the text relate? Uh, how does it exist in itself? How does it relate to what the author is meaning? And then how does it relate to um, all the other things that are going on in the world? Okay, so again, noticing that text is not just in itself one thing, but it's connected to all these other things that go on, right? So um, one example would be Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, okay? That was given in a moment. There are examples he uses, ethos, pathos, logos, uh, the words he uses in the speech, but it doesn't exist on its own, right? It, it exists connected to a bigger, broader universal idea or concept. So your task is to be able to work through those different levels as you're analyzing things, okay? So we're gonna do some practice with that, okay? The thing we're gonna start with, okay, the thing we're gonna start with is a museum exhibit, okay? A museum exhibit from the Maryland Historical Society, okay? The State of Maryland Historical Society. They have a museum that has important items from uh, throughout, you know, the history of the state. <clears throat> they have this particular one that is uh, metalwork is the name of it, 1793 to 1880. So these are very old uh, historical items. Okay. And so again, if we look at it, I'll zoom in so we can kind of see. I don't know if hopefully I'm not in the way too much. You guys can kind of see what's going on. You can see the, there's these pictures these different cups, these chalices, okay? When you're looking at them, literally what do you see there, right? This is again, what we're focusing on. Not any sort of interpretation yet, but the first thing is just observing, factually observing. So the questions are, what do you see? What is literally there? And I'll give you some time to answer. This is my little egg puzzle that we're gonna try out, okay? So from there, again, you might notice that it's, that it's silver, okay, that it's well polished and taken care of, that it has all these very ornate designs on them, right? So it obviously it took a lot of work to, <clears throat> to create these. A lot of craftsmanship went into the creation of these. And then also continually, a lot of care went in to create them and take care of them. Okay, so that's again, initially, what do we see? What do we notice? The next thing then, right? The next thing is what is this bigger meeting, right? I'm gonna to try to move again, me out, keep me out of the way. Again, what could the purpose be from the Maryland Historical Society? What's the point of this exhibit? So it's in their museum. Um, people can come in, teachers will bring in students walk them around, people will look at this and will say, okay, what is the point of this? Uh, what is the purpose? Why would these things be displayed? And I'll give you a second to answer. I mean, we can say things like to show um, the craftsmanship of whoever created it. Uh, maybe it was from some historically famous Maryland Marylander, 
Marylandian, however you refer to somebody from Maryland. So some historical figure that was from Maryland. Um, just to show what stuff was like way back in the day, relatively neutral purpose, okay? Relatively straightforward museum type purpose we have for these items, okay? So the next thing, I'm going to introduce you to a concept, something called institutional critique. Institutional critique, where um, it could be an academic, maybe university professor, uh, a social critic, a uh, social philosopher takes um, items out of a museum, rearranges them to create some sort of message, right? To create some bigger, broader purpose, some bigger, broader argument. The thing to keep in mind with a museum is that oftentimes they don't show you everything they have in their collection. They'll bring out certain things at a time. So what the Maryland Historical Society did is they allowed uh, this artist, Fred Wilson, to go through this practice of institutional critique, right? This practice of institutional critique. And he created a new exhibit using their items to add to a message, to create a new message in how he rearranged the items and how they were displayed, okay? So again, this idea of institutional critique he rearranged and put different items together. And what we're going to notice is how this changes meaning, how this changes meaning. So I'm going to show you the real metalwork exhibit. Okay. So this is the actual exhibit that he created. Okay. If you notice the first one that I showed you, okay, the first one that I showed you, I was actually hiding part of it. Okay. I was hiding part of it where you could not see what was in the center here. Okay, I kind of moved the little sign to hide the center. So your eye was only drawn on the fancy silver items, right? But in the actual exhibit, the actual meta work exhibit, okay, there is a new item here, right? There's a new item here. And it is these manacles, right? To call them handcuffs, okay, that were used to bind slaves, right? So again, the name of the exhibit is Metalwork, hold on, sorry, Metalwork, 1793 to 1880, 1793. So now, if we're looking at these silver items, and if we're looking at these, uh, again, you could refer to them as manacles, chains, handcuffs that have been added to the exhibit, the question is, now what do we see? You're not yet interpreting, right? You're not saying what it means yet. But now physically, literally, what do you see? And I'll give you a minute to respond. And clearly what we see is these iron, right? A cheap metal, relatively ugly metal, Okay, not well maintained, not taken care of. It contrasts to these other silver items around them. Okay, there is no craft work or handiwork or craftsmanship that went into the creation of these manacles compared to the silver items, right? The, the chalices, the mugs, the pitchers. No care was taken into cleaning or maintaining them, right? And then again, there's also the contrast in who used them who they were for, okay? The silver items, of course, would be for the slave owner. The manacles would be for the slave in 1793 to 1880. So now then the next level. So if I go back to my, uh, the circles I showed you at the beginning, okay? So we have these different levels of how we are analyzing and interpreting the text. We have these text details, there's literally there. And there's this author's purpose and the bigger, broader universal theme that it connects to and it relates to. So now we saw, okay, here's what's literally actually there. The next question is, what does it mean now? We have this, we have this change, we have this contrast, um, we have this new item added. Okay, so with that, looking at the, uh, 
the iron manacles with the silver drink set, what is the meaning now? And I'll pause again for you to respond. So the new meaning, right? Based on the contrast we see between the two, we have this contrast between what the manacles are and what the silver is. And of course, uh, there's also a symbolic meaning behind each one, okay? What they represent and who they represent, right? What they represent and who they represent. The people they are connected to. So it could also be ethos, uh, not just uh, pathos, right? So there's emotional attachment. If you, again, look, if you, if you notice the difference when you're first looking at the metalwork item, okay? The first time I showed it to you, as I said, it really doesn't have much meaning to it. It's rather just kind of generic. Look, here's some old stuff from a long time ago, the type of generic purpose museums have, right? But now, with the addition of the, with the manacles, with the juxtaposition, with the contrast between them, okay, it adds this deeper meaning that was not there before. It adds an ethos or it adds a pathos to the, uh, to the exhibit that we didn't have before. So it, again, it creates this message. So the question would be then, what is his purpose? Okay. Why would he create this exhibit? What is the bigger, broader message that he has? Not just how does the meaning change, okay? But then the person behind this, right? Um, I'll go back again to the picture for Fred Wilson, okay? The artist um, took the time, looked through all the different items that the Maryland Historical Society had, pieced them together, put them together for what purpose, what sort of message, right? And this is where you get into, again, the idea of remember our thesis formula, okay? Remember the thesis formula we have. I'm gonna add this in here real quick, okay? Author uses details in order to fire sauce the purpose, okay? So including each one, right? What are the details we see in here, okay? What is the fire sauce word you would use? And then what is the ultimate purpose? So when you respond, when you're going to tell me what his purpose is, it should be in that structure. Okay? It should be following that format because there is something active, a fire sauce word that you need to use when you're describing what the purpose is. And again, I'll let you respond. Okay. Lastly, what sort of rhetorical devices could we use? Right? What sort of rhetorical devices, what, what, those are the vocab words, right? What vocab words could we use? Um, get that pesky guy out of the way. Right, let me add this again, just so we have a reminder. What are the vocab words? Possibly, and this is again where I'm gonna have you maybe start reviewing what the vocab words are. So things like juxtaposition, things like contrast, symbol, those are all things that can be helpful in explaining what is the purpose behind this, why this thing exists, okay? So reviewing all of these, right? Reviewing all of these, meaning comes from what is in the text, okay? Meaning comes from what is in the text and how those different details relate to each other, okay? So it's not just that there's this one item in here, okay? It's not just that there's this one item in here. It's how does this one item connect to the other items that are uh, around it, right? The other items that are around it. How do they interact with each other? And together, how do they create the meaning, right? Because just on their own, the silver items don't really have any meaning. They don't mean much, right? They're just blah, just like there. But the connection of all these different things together, that is what creates meaning. Okay. The relationship, the association we have, connotation, there's another one. The connotation the words have, uh, placing these things together, right, is what creates that meaning. Because again, just on their own, it's like, oh, look at this cool shiny stuff. Ooh, shiny. 
but by adding them together, placing them together, it gives us that bigger, broader purpose to like, uh, to remind us the reality of what these items were used for, to remind us the reality of who used these items or who they were for. Okay, each one uh, is for a specific person, right? Has a specific purpose uh, to remind us that separation that existed. Okay? Using these phys physical objects to remind us uh, th that again that separation that existed in society at that time, that there was the free ruling class, and then there was the weak and powerless enslaved class. Both of them represented in in these objects. Right, and by placing them together, it creates that association, it creates that association in our heads. Okay, so again, as we are going through, right, we're looking at how we move from just those basic text details to the author's purpose, to what is this bigger, broader social issue or universal theme that uh, the text relates to.